Welcome to our first session this morning. I welcome you. Uh, my name is Tom Goodman, and on behalf of the Minnesota Woodworking Guild, we're really happy to have you here today. Uh, this morning's presentation is uh, George von Bruska. He's going to talk about uh, joints using the rouser table and a couple other things before we get started is the restrooms are inside. Please wear a mask uh, going inside the uh, armory and there are tables inside uh, from other vendors and there's also a tool store store in there. Later on this morning a uh, Food truck will be available so that you have munchies at uh, around noon. So George's uh, goal is to help you be a better woodworker. And he's done this and throughout his career has done this through teaching in various uh, areas totally around the world from what I talked to him last night in Africa and uh, Europe and also throughout the United States. So uh, without further, I'll give you George and uh, go ahead. Cool. How y'all doing? Good job ordering lighter for today. This is, thank you. Um, man, what a beautiful day. And I give you credit for coming to a woodworking show on a nice day like this when we only had so many of these left. Um, like Tom said, we're gonna do router table today and we're, we'll do the best we can with the camera set up here to get you the detail shots to help you see that. Um, and if you, you know, if I get to where there's kind of a critical setup and you want me to pause for a second so you can come up and look at it because you can't quite catch it on the screen, then that's fine. Just let me know. Um, Mark Dujinski is not able to come today, so we're going to extend a little bit into his time. So um, I brought a few extra things we can go beyond what I was originally intending to do. And then two, just anywhere along the way, if you got a question, stop me. It's easier to grab that stuff right when it comes up than it is to try to backtrack later and, and reset to answer questions after the fact. Um, for me, router tables in general, question I get all the time from woodworkers is, well, like, what are the first five tools I should get? Router table is really high on the list for me because it's such a versatile thing. There are so many things we can do with it. In addition to what we can do with it as a router table, there is, oddly, a router hanging in there. And we can take that router out and use it for handheld stuff too. So there's a lot of versatility that comes from having a router table in your shop. You can use a router table as a jointer if you don't have a jointer in your shop yet, plus the different joinery and edge details, the joinery like we're gonna do today. This particular setup is a benchtop router table and it is equipped with a lift. And um, so a lift is an elevator for the router. As I turn a crank on there, it's gonna raise and lower the router and there are a couple setups today where that's going to really help where the height of the bit is fussy. Um, overall, it's not a must have, but it's a nice thing to have. And I recognize it adds a lot to the cost of buying a router table. Um, to do similar setup without a lift, there are tools from Triton is a great example where a, a lift type mechanism is built right into their routers. Um, the Milwaukee routers have a screw thread you can access from above the router table. They can help you do height adjustments. In my experience with those, they're not quite as finite as a lift. A lift is still the best way to go, but as a workaround uh, to save some money on buying a lift, that um, those products are a good alternative. The particular router in here is a two and a quarter horse, 12 amp router, it's a quarter cable router. That's a pretty good size for a router table. My main table in my shop is a three horse router and I went that direction there specifically for when I do raised panel doors. So three horse is a 15 amp motor. The difference between this router and the one in that other router table will be when I do raised panels with this unit, I do it in three passes. When I do raised panels with the three horse router, I can do it in two passes. But the mainstream stuff like we're gonna do, especially today, um, you wouldn't really see a difference between this two and a quarter horse and the three horse. The big benefit to uh, the two and a quarter horse, horse in here is that three horse router weighs 19 pounds. So back to that concept of, I can take it out of the table and use it for handheld applications, that's a lot of router. Um, that router on a dovetail jig to do half line dovetails would be kind of awkward to handle. This would be much easier to handle. What's another thing 
Um, since we're talking about something like raised panel bits, what's another router feature then that we're going to want to have? Variable speed. So as diameter goes up, RPM has to go down. So again, as you're shopping for a router in the perfect world, something that's variable speed is a big benefit. Um, one of the things you may notice as I run the router today, most variable speed routers also have what's called soft start. So it can take a little getting used to sometimes. You turn the router on and it ramps up to speed instead of just popping right to 23,000 RPM. Um, the other thing we get from that is that, um, and I don't think we'll hear that with any of these cutters today, but again, with those bigger panel razors, sometimes you'll hear the router kind of dog down and then come back to speed. And that's that electronic variable speed doing what it's supposed to do, which is um, you set it for 10,000 RPM or whatever, and when you first make contact, it slows the bit down, it recognizes it needs more amperage to maintain 10,000 RPM, then it'll come back up to that speed and you'll be able to keep going from there. Um, so, like I said, I don't think that with what we're doing today, you'll hear that much. Questions so far? All right, I'll, router's unplugged and I can do that here so you won't see me messing with the plug on the floor because I can unplug the router from its main switch. So the first thing I'm going to do is just a real simple rabbit joint. Great way to put boxes together. Um, that combo is going to be a rabbit and then also a groove like you would put a box bottom, a drawer bottom into. I'm going to use a three quarter inch straight bit for that. So let's start with a little lesson right there, which is I'm putting the router bit in. And what we want to do is not put the router bit all the way in, and I'll talk about why not. And we also want to not put it in far enough. General rule of thumb is two thirds of that shank should be in the collar. So this is a fairly obvious accident waiting to happen. If I'm not grabbing enough of that shank, there's an opportunity for that bit to come loose. We don't want that. If I go all the way in, if you look really closely at a router bit, commonly where the shank of the bit meets the body of the bit, there's a little fillet right there. There's an inside corner. And if we just do that, there's a chance that that collet is now trying to grab that oversized fillet instead of the nicely machined shank of the router bit, which can lead to the collet coming loose. So it's fine to do this, then back out, just a little bit, just to get away from that weird diameter. I'm going to do, we're going to do this joint in Baltic birch plywood which is half-inch material. Um, so as a, as a totally non-related side note, um, it is interesting with Baltic birch plywood because it's an imported product. Although we call it half-inch Baltic birch, it isn't really half-inch, it's 12 millimeter, which is just slightly under half-inch. Um, you'll see that come into play when we do the next joint that we're gonna do, which is a little bit more thickness specific. The one that we're doing now, it, it doesn't play into it at all, but it's good to know when you're setting up for joinery. I am a really big fan of avoiding measuring whenever I possibly can. And um, for this setup, a common rule of thumb is the depth of cut should be half the thickness of the material on a rabbit or a dado. And I'll do that by using bar stock instead of using a ruler. And with bar stock, I find that it's much more repeatable and it's just plain easier I'm going to get close, put an insert in the table. Right. 
even on good systems, even on good router lifts, there can be a little bit of backlash in the threads. And this is true on your table saw as well when you're setting the height finitely, like a dado. It's always best to go too low. Um, I learned this in my machine shop days. Um, it's always best to go low and then come back up to the setting to make sure that it's going to stay right where you want it. So to take advantage of the bar stock here, I would grab quarter inch bar stock. And then as I'm raising this, I'm just feeling across the top here. It's easier to feel this than it is to see it. And I'm feeling for when the top of the carbide is even with the top of the brass. These sets of bar stock are like 20 bucks. And it's a one-time purchase. You know, you're not, they're not gonna break. Um, in addition to what we're doing here, if I'm doing work with a plunge router, I'll put this in between the stop rod and the turret on the plunge router to set up the cut. Drill press, same idea. Height of a dado head, similar to what we're doing here. So it's a great, it's a really good thing to have. Height is set. I'm gonna lock the lift. Oops. There. Then when the fence comes over, what we want is we want the width of the rabbit. So a rabbit is a little L-shaped relief we're gonna make in the end here. And when I put these two parts together, when I'm done, they're gonna go like this. And one of three things is gonna happen. If I get the fence in exactly the right spot, when I join this with a rabbit, this space will be perfectly even with this end. That'd be cool. If I miss with the fence, if I don't set it in the right position, if I don't set it far enough, that face, will project past this end. So easy fix, right? Then I just sand that entire face till it's flush. Okay, thank you for giggling. No, we don't want to do that. Especially with plywood, um, you'll sand the veneer off in a heartbeat. Alternatively, if I set it a little bit too deep, the end grain is past the face. So in my woodworking, my choice is, I'm gonna make the mistake I know I can fix. So could I, fuss and fuss and fuss with that fence and make them perfect. Maybe, probably, I guess. But it's fussy and I don't know, just woodworking being woodworking, then one comes out right, one comes out maybe wrong. And If I overcut it just a little bit, and a little bit is like, I always say just a fingernail catch, a 30 second of an inch. If I overcut it, I can glue these together and is it easy to fix that little projection that's going past? So a lot of nods. You can sand it. If it's solid wood, you can block plane it. You can flush trim. You can use a flush trim router bit. There are all sorts of solutions for that. This is the same approach I take when I make cabinet carcasses. I overcut that rabbit at the top of the cabinet and then I flush trim it after the fact. So then it looks trim. It looks to everybody else like you made it perfect. But you made your woodworking life easier by cheating just a little bit. So one of the things we know, Baltic birch plywood, it's a funny dimension. It's 12 millimeters, which isn't a half inch. So even though I love my bar stock, this is not a good application for bar stock. Instead, I'm going to close my fence faces a little bit. The way I'll do this is, I'm gonna turn that router bit so that the cutter is top dead center away from the fence. It's at the like highest, furthest point of its arc away from the fence. Then, bring the fence over and bring the material down the fence now I'm feeling that carbide again. Don't try to look at it. It's easier to feel it than to see it. So when I run my finger here, I can just feel the carbide projecting a bazillionth of an inch past the face of the plywood. I'm gonna lock one end and then check it again. And lock the other end. 
Now, when I look at this, my fence is a little out of line. It's not parallel to the table. Do I need to redo that? You got a 50-50 chance, it's yes or no. Okay, no. So, again, when we do hands-on classes in my shop, this is often a point of confusion for people. On a table saw, we make such a big deal out of, you get your table saw, and you have taken the time to get the blade perfectly parallel to the miter gauge slot, right? Everybody did that. Then you take the time to get the fence perfectly parallel to the blade. Everybody did that. That's a really big deal on a table saw because the cutting plane is this way. It's vertical. On a router table, the cutting plane is horizontal. It's the router bit. So this fence could be completely kerflui. This fence can be at any angle you want across the router table, and it doesn't matter unless what? Unless I'm using a unless I'm using the miter gauge. If you're running something in this slot, then you probably have to parallel the fence to that slot. And it's, I think every router table I've ever owned has had a miter gauge slot. I don't think I've ever put a miter gauge in it. It just not, you'll see my workaround for that when we get to the coping stick. All right, so theoretically, we're ready to go rabbit hunting, right? Any questions before I make noise? That's going to go there. You always want to push pad, not your hand on that. Um, so you're never passing your hand over a cutting tool. Same with a dado head. demos we can gauge um, how far we are from the outlet by how long it takes the tool to come up to speed. I did a woodworking show um, where I was doing cabinet making all weekend long on a saw stop table saw with a dado head in it and man it, it took about five minutes for that saw to, there were about 300 feet of extension cord for me to the outlet. All right so then my check that would be a test cut and then we can do a couple things here to test our work. One, we cut a rabbit. We want it to be a quarter inch deep. So you drop the bar stock in there, and if that's flush across the face, you're done. Now, this is another good spot where like, you can go nuts pulling your hair out, and I obviously can't afford to do that. So a, a thing I try to teach in woodworking, and I know there are some engineers in the group who are, you might want to cover your ears when I say this. In woodworking, typically, Consistency is more important than accuracy. So, when I test this, if it's off by the thickness of a Kleenex, I'm gonna leave it alone. As long as every rabbit I cut for this project is identical, you're probably gonna be okay. Now there's scenarios where, I don't know, I'm making this thing that has to perfectly fit into an opening, then maybe we need to finesse that a little bit more. But if I make it a box and I'm going to put screws in here, if it's not a perfect quarter, you got to know when to let go so that you can enjoy woodworking, not work at your woodworking. So that's one test is the bar stock goes in. If we're pretty close to having flushicity there, then you're going to be fine. Then the other test is when I do this, do I have that little catch. And if you do, again, that's what we want. Because then you glue these together, and like I said, flush trim router bit, block plane, not on plywood for a block plane, belt sander, whatever you want to use to flush those up after the fact. Okay, that was easy peasy. You're a very good group. Look how easy that was. All right, questions on that? Because I'm going to swap router bits. I have a question. On your LC table, I think I saw it kind of caught a little. Well, that was more the way, yeah, it did catch a little, which was more the way I was feeding than anything else. That I, what happened was, um, as I came across the opening, that piece pulled off the fence just a little bit, and that caused that lead corner to cock into the fence. 
So an out around that, if I close that opening up some more, then that would have helped me avoid that. Yeah, yeah, operator error. And it's it's nice with a rabbit, so if in, in my cabinet class, where we do rabbit and data joinery in the carcasses, we always cut the rabbit first. Because if something goes kerflui, which is a technical jargon thing, but still, if this goes wrong and pulls off the fences on cutting it, you can conceivably not take enough material off, but you can't take off too much if it pulls away from the fence. All you need to do, don't back up, finish the cut, come back, run it again. So we do the rabbits first so people get it, we're doing it on a dado head on a table saw, but so people get a feel for that. Because when you do the, da the dado, and the dado blade has to be confined in that trough, that U-shaped joint you're cutting, that's a one-shot deal. You can't pull off the fence when you're doing a dado. So it's, it's, a good, you know, it's a good procedure for you where if we're using both of those joints, do the rabbit first to get a feel for how that's gonna go. It's a great question. So sometimes you want to um, slide the infeed fence over and, and cover, bury part of the bit. That's called zero clearancing your fence. Um, we'll see how things go later. I may or may not do it with this bit when we do the next joint. So if this cut, as I made it, was chipping out real bad, then I would zero clearance that infeed side. I pretty commonly do it on lock miters, drawer locks, um, maybe a sliding dovetail or something like that. And the way you do it, it's very simple. You just, you run the router bit, in feed face is loose, and just push that into the cutter. And I know people get, um, people get funny about this because you're cutting into your router table fence, but on a good router table, those fences are interchangeable and flippable. So you actually have eight corners you can cut into, so you can zero clearance it eight times. And then, clearly these faces are longer than what I need, so if it gets real chewed up, then you just go to a miter saw, cut an end off, and you start all over again. Generally, those faces are three quarter inch thick material, so if you cut them and cut them and cut them and cut them, which is where I'm at on my table in my shot, then I just replace them with melamine fences. And you're right back to where you started. Do you have any issues if you ever cut more than half a diameter or a bit? Right? Do you want to kick out or anything, or are you always less than half of your bit? Well, that's a, so when I'm doing a rabbit, I chose a three quarter inch bit for this half inch material. So I'd like the diameter of that cutter to exceed the size of the rabbit that I'm producing. If I'm doing a three quarter inch rabbit, I'll still use a three quarter inch bit, and then, um, you're still going to be okay. So is that what you meant? Yeah, just because of the way it's cutting. Yeah. Joe? Yep. Um, you got a front end here that's being halfway off the. So. Well, I think we're. Okay. There you go. Most of these router lifts, this, like your planer, one revolution is a sixteenth of an inch. So what's cool with that is the way you can then finesse that, so that's a sixty-four. It makes it really easy when you're dialing in a final height to get that, um, to just get it really, really close. Now, when we do this, So, the collet nut here is loose. The router bit is still, it's unplugged. The router bit is still stuck. So when I was a kid, when I started woodworking, when I got my very first Porter Cable router in like 1984, um, 
What we had to do at this stage of the game was take a router and wrench and tap the bit to get it to release. So the way a collet works is that this is the collet and this is the collet nut. When you draw this down, the collet is tapered, the inside of the motor shaft is tapered. So as we tighten this, it's pulling this taper into that taper. So what's happened now is that the nut is loose, but the tapers are still locked up. That's why the bit won't come out. With modern technology, this is most router companies today have what's called a self-releasing collar. So it's loose, but it's a two-stage deal. When I go a little bit more loose, the top of that nut is gonna pull up on that snap ring. <coughs> there and then that'll pop right out so if you're struggling getting your router bits out you're probably just not backing that collet nut out far enough. Did you say that's just the newer router? yeah but um well newer i don't know 10 years probably but you can get this collet looks exactly like my 1984 collet except it's self-releasing. So for 25 bucks, you can buy this on Amazon and put it in your 40-year-old Porter Cable 690. And you won't always see the snap ring out external like that. Um, on my DeWalt, it's, the snap ring is internal inside the nut, but it's doing the same thing. So next we'll cut a groove for a bottom. We're doing that, um, probably can't see that well enough. I was gonna ask the test question of, is this an up cut or a down cut spiral router bit? And the way to tell is, if the flutes on the bit look exactly like a drill bit, it's an up cut, because they're doing the same thing. They're excavating the waste out of the cut. If they're reversed from what you would see on a drill bit, then it's a down cut. That down cuts are for putting material back on. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Don't encourage me. Now, I talked about bar stock. Now we don't want bar stock because we've got an existing part. So I use the bar stock in step one to make this happen. But now what we really want to do when we get groovy for the next cut is we want this work to match what we already did in step one. So now I use this to set the depth for this. Because maybe my quarter inch wasn't really a quarter inch. So if I use the bar stock again, my results might not be what I want. So instead, this is currently, it's just resting on the cutter and it's up off the table. So if I lower it and then come back up a little, and I'm just gonna kind of seesaw through this, I'm looking for the spot where it start, the router bit starts to jack that material up off the table and create a little space. Right about there. And then depending on what you're trying to make happen here, we could lean on, we could lean on our bar stock again. If I want a half inch space between the bottom of the groove and the bottom of the box, my half inch bar stock can go in there. Use that. It's kind of kissing right now. And again, I've got one flute perfectly again in this direction, at top dead center in this direction. Move the other end. It's a lot easier, I find, to adjust the fence by 
anchoring one end and then making tiny movements over here and then anchoring the other end instead of trying to move the whole fence. Then we'd end up with this. So a couple of rules on the road there. Everything I'm doing is right to left. You always want to go right to left on a router table, never go left to right. Uh, the reason for that is the bit rotation. The bit from this direction is spinning counterclockwise. When we work in the northern hemisphere, it's counterclockwise. <laughs> All bits spin counterclockwise on a router table. So when I go this way, the cutting action of the bit is holding the material against the fence. If you feed the other direction, it pulls it away from the fence. It's really bad, really fast. Um, and never back up for that same reason. If, if you back up on a router table, there's a chance there for the bit to grab your stuff and pull it away from the fence. And then we never want to cut in between the bit and the fence. So let's say we have, a I don't know, an OG profile in here. We never want to set this up where we're trying to feed the material in between the fence and the inside edge of the cutter. I know you've seen these before, you don't get this. Okay, that simple rabbit. Any questions on that before I swap cutters around? Yep. Is there a situation, I think you know, what you're saying is you put the material in between, but I think there might be a couple applications where you're actually feeding it the opposite way. I would never trap the material between the fence and the cutter. Never, ever, ever trap the material between the fence and the cutter. Just because, I mean, it's a little bit like, I don't know, I'm trying to get a table saw analogy, but the, um, the danger is just that, like, let's say, let's say I want to rabbit this piece if I try to do that by feeding sort of like this, if this lifts off the fence just a little bit, I'm pulling it right across that cutter. I mean, never is a really long time, but I'm still gonna say, like, I just, in a, in a few years of woodworking, I've never had an occasion where I, that's been imperative to set it up that way. And then somebody else said, there are some shapers that uh, can reverse the spindle, and of course, then you have a like, profile bit that is a clockwise bit yeah. that you'll feed from left to right. So the same principles, of course, apply. <clears throat> shapers are a whole different kettle of fish, and it's an interesting. Um, I want to watch our time, but we're fine because we actually have till eleven thirty. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, shapers versus router tables. Broad brush strokes. A shaper is a high power, low RPM tool. A router table is a low power, high RPM tool. So shapers typically have induction motors in them, the same kind of big motor that's driving big table saws, a stationary planer. Routers are a universal motor. That's what's in a shot back, in a benchtop planer, in a um, benchtop table saw. So. Um, with shapers, they typically their speed range is like a two speed, 8,000 and 10,000 or something like that. And it's accomplished by generally by changing belts on a step pulley. Where with a router, we get variable speed, usually something like 10,000 to 24,000. Um, what we're so part of what we need to look at there is we're trying to get cuts per minute in order to get good cut quality. 
So if I have a two flute cutter at 24,000 RPM, how many cuts per minute am I getting? 48,000. It's two flutes, 24,000. So on a shaper where I think sometimes woodworkers get in trouble with shapers is a lot of shapers have available a router collar. You can take the shaper spindle off and put in a router collar. If you run this quarter inch bit in a shaper at 10,000 ripples, it's going to be horrible performance. It's nowhere near fast enough for that bit to perform. So how do you get a, how do they get around that on a shaper? What do shaper cutters look like? They've got more wings. So a shaper cutter is commonly three or four wings instead of two. So at 10,000 RPM, a four wing cutter is 40,000 cuts per minute. That's how it equates what we get here. So if you're, if you're looking to open a cabinet shop and you're gonna make raised panel doors all day every day, you're gonna be better off with the induction motor in a shaper, will be better capable of handling that. That being said, my Porter Cable 7518 three horse motor has cut 11, 11 billion raised panels in my shop in probably 25 years and I've never replaced it. So um, the other thing shapers offer is the ability to reverse the spindle. So what's cool with that is, you know, we, um, I probably don't have any good examples here, but commonly in wood, well, this one's kind of that way. When we're cutting wood, you want to read the grain and cut it in the direction that it wants to be cut. So the analogy I often use is, when you pet a cat, and I don't know why you would, but if you chose to pet a cat, when you, when you pet it from head to tail, the cat likes that because the hair is laying down. So this piece of wood is your cat, and the grain is doing this, this. So this cat wants to get petted in this direction. And if I pet it in this direction, just like on a cat, the hairs, which are fibers in the wood, stand up and can sometimes chip off if it's a gnarly piece of wood, if it's bird's eye maple or flame birch or something like that. So with a reversible shaper, one of the benefits is kind of regardless of the grain direction, we can control our feed direction so by having the ability to reverse the direction on the spindle. So it gives us a few more options. But for most people, a router, you can't take an induction motor out of a shaper and use it handheld to cut dovetails on your jig. So for most people, a router table is still gonna be a better shape. Question for Alan. So, so let's say you built a drawer box out of what you were putting together there. Then you've got something less than a quarter of an inch left over um, at the bottom of your rabbits. Yeah. How do you have to assemble it and measure to know what your drawer box is? Going yeah. To so be? what we do, the way I approach that is. Um, like if you're using mechanical slides, they can be. Well, not can be, they are fussy. So a drawer box on mechanical slide should be one inch and a 16th smaller than the opening you're putting it into. One inch accommodates the metal slides, a 16th gives you a little bit of wiggle room so that you're not trying to force the drawer in. So what, the way I do that is, I set up the rabbit cutter or the lock rabbit, like we're about to do, cut it twice, Good catch. put these two pieces together. So I have a rabbit and a rabbit. Imagine this one was rabbited. And then with, with digital calipers, I measure the lead behind is what I call it. This, this being the lead behind. We need to very finitely know what this number is. That then tells me how long my drawer front and my drawer back are going to be to accommodate fitting into an opening at all or fitting between drawer slides or whatever it is you're trying to do. So you got to start with test cuts and then finesse it from there. Yeah, now, my favorite way to make boxes. You go to Ikea and you buy a box. <laughs> and we skip this part of the demo. 
I love making lock rabbit joints. It's a tiny bit fussy to set up, um, but it beats the heck out of like a drawer lock bit or a lock miter bit. And once you do it a couple times, it's gonna go fast for you. So we're gonna do everything with a slot cutter, in this case, a quarter inch slot cutter. So this rule is your cutter dimension has to be half as big as the material you're using. Half inch Baltic birch, quarter inch slot cutter. Three quarter inch drawer box, three eighths cutter. You can do this on a dado head on a table saw or you can do it on your router dado. Lock rabbit, what's gonna happen when we're done with this is we're not gonna just get this. We're gonna get a dado across here that a tongue fits into. So all this has given us is glue surface. There's no mechanical bind between this piece and this piece. The lock rabbit gives us the mechanical bind and glue surface. Here's the rule, quarter, quarter, quarter. So working with half inch material, quarter, quarter, quarter. What that means is quarter inch slot cutter. I'm gonna grab my quarter inch bar stock and I'm gonna use that to position, wow. I'm gonna use that to position that slot cutter a quarter inch above the table. Get it as close as you can, a test cut's gonna tell us if it's right. Okay, it was quarter, 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 so we're missing one. The last one is, we're done with this. I'm gonna bring the fence out. Again, get to that top dead center. One cutter is as far from the fence as it can get. And then I'm positioning this for a quarter inch depth of cut. And the way this works is one piece gets fed horizontally, the mating piece gets fed vertically. catching me at the end. Then our test is that <coughs> and this. Just a tiny bit too tight. So when I'm doing joinery, what I'm looking for is I want to be able to push this piece into this piece by hand. Well, it's not horrible. That's eh, just maybe a little bit too small. 
But when I do this, they should stay stuck together, but they're not quite closed there. I shouldn't have to use a mallet and pound these. So same with the dado head, same with the mortise and tenon. I should be able to just slide them together. Mortise and tenon might need a little tapping, but you should never have to drive the parts together. So think about the dynamic here. Can I change the size of that dado? We got some yeses and some noes. What do you want? Who are we going to vote off the island? Yeah, so we want to do it in one pass. Okay, so yeah, I, I should have further qualified the question. Cutting this the way we did, can I change this? No, because that's based on the size of the carbide. That's a given. How do I change this? I raise or lower the cutter. So if I do this and it goes together loosey-goosey, lunch is here! Back to that ADHD discussion again. Squirrel! What? Oh, this. Okay. If I put these together and it's all loosey-goosey, the tongue isn't big enough, you have to raise the cutter to make this component fatter. This is just a little bit too tight. I need to lower the bit to make this just a tiny bit thinner than it is. The fence location isn't critical. So this will this will come down back to what we were saying, like at the end of the day, if I'm making something that's got to fit in somewhere, I need to know this lead behind and its mate on the other end of the drawer box, but whether it's truly a quarter inch or not, I don't really care that much. So I'm not worried about the fence, but I'm worried about the tongue. I have to go down so remember that whole backlash in the system concept. So I'm going to go down probably too far and then come back half of that. And then I'm going to mark these because we already did that. We already did that. Now technically, I don't really have to recut this because that groove size isn't going to change, but I'm going to go ahead and cut them both again just because. <coughs> we have nature's dust collector out here. It's, the wind is blowing in just the right direction. It's taking everything back there. together second part of the test do they stay stuck yes so that's set that height is a distinctly correct position for this bit so what did what did I just make in addition to the joint what else do I have now hmm? I would recommend keeping one of these because the next time you set up this bit, this is your gauge block now for where that cutter should be set. So I don't know if I've ever had that bit sharpened or not. If I did, it's not a quarter inch slot cutter anymore. It's a 0.235 slot cutter now instead of 0.250. So whatever the thickness, the width of that carbide tip is, that's this. So if I cut this off and I mark save rabbit lock joint, lock rabbit joint, I can use that instead of my bar stock to set the height of that cutter next time. This goes back to that old zero clearancing the fence idea. Baltic birch is a very chippy material. 
So if you're getting this, if you zero clearance the infeed side, this will go away completely. You won't have any chipping. So this is an occasion where I would do that. Now, wait, there's more. What's cool about this is now that we're set, the whole joinery is we've got our lock rabbit. And again, we're mechanically bound. This is your drawer front and back. So like a dovetail, if I pull in this direction, I can't get those to come apart even with no glue in there. So that's why we like that for a drawer. Plus we've got glue surface. The other thing we can do now is cut the bottom for the groove for the bottom with this same setup. So your drawer making becomes We make this cut, then we're going to make this cut. I'll do that now so you can see it work. These go this, and this, and this. So one of the things, maybe you notice here, is I never wipe the router table down. I always blow it off. Um, as just a habit with my tools, I never wipe my tools down. And the reason for that is just, it's a bad habit to get into when cutters are spinning in the world. So it doesn't matter, bandsaw blade, bandsaws take forever to wind down. Table saws take a long time to slow down. Router tables take a long time to slow down. So I don't want to be in the habit of doing this, and then someday when I'm in a big hurry, because I'm behind and when am I not behind, um, I'm doing that and the router bit is still spinning and I get up close and personal with the bit. So I'm very much in the habit of just, or clean it off with the vacuum. It's, I never wipe tools down with my hand. In the world of economy and movement, this is what's so cool about this, is now with one setup, you get the joint and you get the groove for the bottom. So it goes really, really, really fast to put stuff together this way. Um, I'll pass those around. If you, need to, if you need to end up with narrow parts, you're gonna use this to do whatever, screw trays, and you only want them to be three inches deep, work with six inch wide parts, <laughs> Those narrow pieces are nearly impossible to safely handle across the router table. But if I do, if I do all of that to this piece, then when you get to the groove step, you groove and you groove, then you go to the table saw and you rip three and three or two and two, whatever you need, then you have your narrow box. But don't try to handle the narrow box pieces on the router table. Was it, you didn't like the woodworking demo, or? <laughs> oh. People walk out on me all the time, not usually the people I bring to the demo. <laughs> yeah, one time or two. Um, lock rabbit, questions? Yes. Yeah, so there's a cool thing, you know, there's a few things going, like, so for me when I make drawers, typically I make the drawer box and then I cover it with the finished front. So this point of, you know, you'll see when those pieces come around, that groove is showing on the end of the box, on the front of the box. Um, I don't care because I'm going to cover that with the finished front. If this is a, you don't want to use this for 
a jewelry box that just as a box is going to sit on top of somebody's dresser unless you're then going to veneer over that outside or something for mask that. Um, this too then, if as it comes around, you slip it together and you'll feel that the end grain of the one piece is past the face grain of the other. Why is that? It goes back to like an hour ago. Because it's Baltic birch plywood. If that material was a perfect half inch thick, the face and the end grain would be perfectly even because of quarter, quarter, quarter. But because it's 12 millimeter and half inch, I think it's 12.4, as a result, that face is just a little bit inside the end grain. Same deal. <coughs> Glue it together, flush trim, a little bit of sanding, something, so you can flush it out. But you can't fix that because it would mess up the fit of the joint. So your priority here is to get the tongue on the end to fit into the existing size of the groove or dado. What's the difference between a groove and a dado? This is, you know, if you're ever on Jeopardy and I'll take woodworking for 400, arcane knowledge in woodworking for 400, please. Dados are across the grain, grooves are with the grain. Who cares? All right. Anything else on the lock rabbit, slot cutter? Can you dovetail the front of a drawer and then lock rabbit the back of the drawer? Can you dovetail the front and lock rabbit the back? Yep, and I do that pretty commonly um, because, you know, when people check my work and they open a drawer to see if I dovetail it, they don't look at the back, they only look at the front. <laughs> so yeah, that's I do that on drawer boxes all the time. No, no, this is a, this is saw stops router table. So you can do this. Um, this is actually made part of the reason it's cast iron. This is made to bolt onto a table saw. There's there um, drilled and tapped holes back here to put that directly on as a wing. But if when I if I have this on my cabinet saw, it's really hard to bring for this. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Oh, great question. Any cutting tool, router bit or table saw blade. So part of that is performance based, you know, as you use it, performance deteriorates, but that can be subjective. So if you take a cutter, yeah, we don't get this on the camera. If you take a cutter, and you take a nail, a thumbnail, and I'm gonna grab that pointy tip right there, not grab it, but I'm just gonna pull that across my thumbnail. And with, I'm not pushing down at all, it's just the weight of the bit. It just scribed my thumbnail, it scored my thumbnail. If I were creative enough, I could sign my name with that in my thumbnail, I don't know why I would. But just that little drag test, is a great way to tell if that's sharp or not. Take the table saw blade out of your table, do the same thing to one tooth. Yep, yep, just get one corner and drag it like that. And if it's not, like you'll feel it, the, the difference here is there's some resistance to this. When this is dull means what? It's rounded over. When it's rounded over, it just kind of slides across your nail, no resistance at all. If you do it with something sharp and something dull, you'll you'll see it right away. And a lot of times it's as simple as um, start with clean the cutter. Because if you get, for this cutter to cut, there has to be clearance behind it. So if you work with a lot of resinous woods, cherry and pine, for instance, you can get buildup behind the cutter that prevents it from having that clearance. And that'll cause it to burn and it'll slow down your feed rate as you cut. So a lot of times just cleaning it is going to be enough to rejuvenate it. Um, so I would do that first and then 
check for no. All right. As a to clean it or no, to. No, it's to keep, keep the stuff from up. So it doesn't stick. Yeah. And if you use the butter, butter flavored pam, you're going to be hungry when you're <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody get that tip? So, like, almost as a cutting lubricant, kind of, spray the bits with pam. And, and George recommends, not George, George recommends the butter flavored to make your shop smell good. Um, and that'll prevent junk from building up on it. All right, door making. So we're going to do this with a two-piece set. One is an end grain cutter, one is a long grain cutter. So I did, historically, for a long time, I used what's called a reversible rail and style bit. If you get that, you just have something that looks like this. Reversible is confusing because you can't reverse a router. But what reverse refers to is we make one cut, loosen the nut, restack these same parts in a different configuration to make the second cut. So I did that in my cabin making classes for a really long time. And when we put the doors together in the end, six or eight people in a class, four doors would be great, four not so much, six doors would be great, two not so much. And what I finally brought that down to was that, what well, a thing I harp about a lot is when you choose in your, in your woodworking, when you choose a reference edge, reference face, reference surface, use that as repeatably as possible. So what was happening with those doors was one of those cuts gets fed good face down on the router table, the other gets fed good face up. So with that change, that's what was messing us up when we brought those parts together at the end. With a two-piece set, good face will always be down on the table for all the cuts. And then if we go a step further, when you're raising the panel, that also gets fed good face down. So I like that we're maintaining that same reference surface for everything. And I like that then, for me, it makes door making a two-bit operation. Krista's the only one that laughed, really? She snorted. She snorted. She didn't really laugh. Um, The cutter with the ball bearing in the middle is the end grain cutter. That's going to leave behind a tongue that'll fit into the groove. The cutter with the ball bearing on the top is the long grain cutter. That's going to make the groove that the panel fits into and that then the end of this goes into. The other name for everything we're doing here, rail and style, cope and style, cope and stick, what happens is coping, we're working on your coping skills now. Coping is when we shape the end of this to match the profile we're gonna put on this, we have coped this to mate with this. So it's coping saw, cutting base trim in your house. You don't miter the corners, you cope the corners. Same concept, that's where coping style comes from. We're going to do the end grain cut first because when I do this and I exit this side, what could happen? I might get some chipping. When this is still square like this, it's pretty easy to figure out how to avoid that. If I put another square piece behind it, I can stop it from chipping. If I've already cut that complicated long grain profile, then I cut the end grain, it's difficult to support that profile and prevent the chipping. So we're going to always do end grain first. If it's a long time between bit uses for you, and you want to keep track of this, on the body of the bit, so not on the carbide, the one with the bearing in the middle, put a one, and the one with the bearing on the top, put a two, because we're always going to use this one first.
Now, before we set the height of the bit, we have to talk about another thingy. So when we feed this cross grain, we're gonna cut this. We know we need to support it on the outfeed side. And it's gonna be easier to do this if we just have some kind of a grippy thing to hold on to this. So a grippy thing is, for me, this little shot made sled. My rails go in here, even with the end. Close the toggle clamp. And then all of this goes past the cut much easier to hold on to than just trying to hold the rail. We need to talk about this because the height of that bit is affected by the fact that that's sitting a quarter inch up off the router bit. When you do this the first time, for most of these cutters, if you make the top of the metal, not the top of the carbide, so there's a metal plate, carbide is fastened to the plate. If you make the top of the plate, the top of the metal, even with the top of your material, that's usually a pretty good first cut. And then looking at the cut, we'll know if we're there or not. What kind of wood is this? Poplar, does that, did that come out? Poplar is a great wood to practice on. It's inexpensive relative to other woods. It is a fairly close grain hardwood, so it's it reacts more like oak or walnut or maple, other woods that you're likely to work with, as opposed to doing your practice work on pine, very open grain, prone to tearing, soft. Um, so turning, lathe turning practice, joinery practice, anything like this, poplar is a great choice for that. For the fence, there's a ball bearing in the bit that's as deep as we can cut, as deeply as we can cut. So all you got to do is make the face of the fence even with that ball bearing. Same deal. I'm going to lock up this end. Then I'm going to pivot the fence a little bit, try to find that spot and lock the other end. Then, with your coping sled, sled against the fence, material against the fence. When I do this test cut, I'm not going to cut all the way through this piece, and then we'll talk about that, why I'm not. So what we're getting, that's not good. We have like zero lip on the front, way too deep a shoulder on the back. So the whole cutter has to come up quite a bit. lip on the front. We have this shoulder on the back. I want this lip to be about half as big as the shoulder here. Generally it works out to about 3 sixteenths, 3 30 seconds in three quarter inch stuff. 
to it. I'm, I'm just thinking through if I'm going to adjust or just move on. It could, the bit could be just a tiny bit lower to make this lip a little bit smaller. Here's the dynamic. The shoulder on the back here leads to, in the next step, how far is the groove away from the back of the door. So if I raise the bit, the shoulder gets small, that retainer gets small and fragile. And then someday somebody slams the door and the panel keeps going because it fractures out of the back of the door. If I go to the other extreme, if I lower the cutter and I make this shoulder really, really big, the lip on the front here leads to a shoulder detail on the front of the door. And that detail goes away. So we need to hit both. The other importance of that is matching the bits to the work you want to do. If you're doing three quarter inch drawers, doors, we want to buy a bit set that hits that range. So the, generally with the bits, it'll say for three quarter inch to seven eighths inch material or whatever. We can get that same profile on a smaller scale. A lot of companies call them junior sets where they work in like half inch to five eighths material. This wouldn't work in half inch material. We can't fit this profile in that thin. If you want to make an entrance door or a passage door for your house, inch and three eighths or inch and three quarter, we have to go up in scale to that bit set that's designed to do that kind of a profile. So when you buy the bits, you want to just make sure they match what you're trying to do. So once this is right, we're going to say that it could go down just a little bit, but I'm going to call it okay. Then you take your door parts, and we want to look at them and choose front and back, and mark the back. And the reason for that is everything gets fed good face down. So if I can see the mark, I know I'm right. A really easy mistake to make is end grain cut. Look at the nodding heads, okay. If you flip instead of rotate, it's really hard to assemble that door. It's kind of, there's, there's an Escher, right, or the drawings where nothing quite, you got an Escher door. So if you mark the back, you should be able to see your X's all the time. Um, when I do this, I'm going to go all the way through that end grain, cut into the sled, and then we'll talk about this. Hit the fence, hit the fence, lock. So in addition to coping my ends, what else did I just make for myself? I have a setup gauge now for the next time I do this. That's why you don't cut into this until the height is right. So the next time I set this up, all I have to do is adjust that height till that'll slip in there. Still do a test cut, but that'll get you really, really, really close. Open questions? Like how does Krista cope with me? Is that one of your questions? George, can I can I mark my boards a different way so I don't have to see my X's every time I <laughs> sorry. How many X's do you have? We won't go there. Oh. <laughs> Are they serving beer? Because this could be a really good conversation. Is it okay if I steal that joke? I got a teaching gig in New York in like three weeks. Yeah. 
Um, let me say, I'm gonna say something else about those marks. A thing I make a really big deal about in my classes and videos is it's really important to do all of that marking. Take your door parts to a bench, put on the Imagine Dragons radio on Pandora, get all your pieces marked, where in that second all you're thinking about is the door parts. You're getting everything labeled, you're making the roadmap for when you get to the router table. What we're doing here is very isolated. I'm cutting one or two or three pieces. If you're making a kitchen full of doors, you could be making, you could be cutting 40 pieces. What I want is when you get to the router table and you're going to cut all those parts, you don't have to stand here and examine, should this go this way or this way? Should this go this way or this way? Because that's how you make a mental mistake and you screw up a part or you screw up a part. When you're running the tool, you should only have to think about running the tool. So same with cabinet carcasses. They all get fed inside face down over a dado head on a table saw. Everybody stands at their bench. We mark the outside, we mark the top, the bottom, the back. That gives you this road map on your parts. So once you get to the tool, work, 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 it tells you exactly what you need to do without fumbling around with these pieces. Bit number two. Now the setup gets way easier because we've got an existing component. successfully cut, put that on the router table. Where that has a tongue sticking out, that cutter has to make a groove to receive it. Make the top of the carbide even with the top of the tongue. This is where it's hard to beat a router lift in the router table. Face of the fence, even with the ball bearing. And for these cuts, we're going to add feather boards. Because it's really critical, once we establish that distance, the height of the cutter, that we maintain that throughout the cut. And if you think about, you know, again, this kind of a sterile environment here, short pieces. In a real cabinet door, your styles could be 24 inches long. So part of the style is ticking up, sticking off the table when you start the cut. You want to make sure you have down pressure to keep it tight to the table. style like this out here and I have down pressure I could seesaw that end of the style up and that's going to screw up the profile so I want a push stick that I can run horizontally like this
is put them together and are we flush here? So part of this answer is are we flush or really, really, really close? What I've seen from doing a lot of cabinet doors in classes is when you do this cut, especially if you're doing a lot of doors, this is subject to how hard am I holding down on the router table as I poke that in. And on the first five, you might be like, yeah, yeah. and by the second 20, you're like, yeah. So that can slightly change this elevation here. So when you put this together, if this is a Kleenex thickness, okay. If it's within a Kleenex, leave it alone. And when you glue this together, seconds with a random orbit sander is gonna be fine. That's why we have a shoulder here. So it's like, in woodworking, we, we trick stuff like this all the time. When you put a leg and rail assembly together, you probably have a reveal. Isn't that a nice design feature between the rail and the leg? Well, it's really there to make our lives easier. Because if you try to make the rail and the leg perfectly flush, and they're not, you can tell. If it's a quarter inch reveal or it's a 930 seconds reveal, is that right? No. Whatever. If, if you miss your reveal by a 30 second, nobody's gonna know. So it's the same here. Part of the reason that shoulder's on the front of these doors is so there's room to do a little sanding here and you can't tell that you did that to the front of the door. This one's off by maybe a little more than I would like to leave. So the bit is up a tiny bit too high. Let me machine this and then I'll pass this around. style questions, router table questions, woodworking questions. Yes, sir. If you have a, a, a grid, you know, where you have to cope it without blowing out the small grid, you know what I mean? So you gotta... If you're doing like a mullion door. Pardon? If you're doing a mullion door. Yep. Yep. You still cope the ends before you do the long grain cut. Okay. Same deal. So. What, it, there's more steps involved, but make the frame. And then on most of these, let me steal this for just one second. On most of these um, router bit profiles, the shoulder on the front is in line, yeah, it is on this one, is in line with the bottom of the groove. So when you dry fit your frame, and now you've got a mullion going across here, when you measure from shoulder, well, probably more likely it'd be this way, when you measure from shoulder to shoulder, that's the length of that motion. And then still go back and do the end grain cuts first, and then do the long grain cuts. If you absolutely need to, um, if you need to do a long grain cut before you do an end grain cut, so honestly, like in a commercial cabinet shop, what they do is they do the long grain cut in eight foot sticks. And then they cut them to length and they cope the end. All you need to do to make that work is this sled. I'm think a second. Yeah, this sled needs the profile cut here so that the coped piece fits into that profile. 
and then you can do that supported so you don't get the chip. And that's how they do it in a, on a commercial basis where they're making billions of it. Left hand spin. They're using shapers. They got one set up right hand, one set up left yeah. hand. Yeah. So I, my friend who owned a cabinet shop and made residential cabinets for years, they had, I think, five shapers. So one always had a cope cutter, the other always had a long grain cutter, another one always had the panel razor, and then the reverse cutters, you know, the same cutters in the other ones, but able to run in the other direction. So they just go. Why, why change bits if you can just change shapers? It's kind of a Norm Abrams approach. <laughs> so what else? Do you need to be worried about, you were talking about cutting the cat in the grain direction. Um, are there ways that I need to be more concerned about supporting this? System? Well, so yes, yeah, so there's some interesting stuff going on. Um, if you can, so the end grain cut's not a big deal. But on your long grain cut, given the opportunity, here's my grain. So that cat wants to get petted this way. If I can feed this piece past the cutter like this, that optimizes my surface finish. Um, you can also zero clearance your in-feed fence, like we talked about with the slot cutter. The other thing, big picture, if you can, generally, when you buy a piece of, when you buy a stick of wood, like red oak is pretty famous for this, but this is my piece of oak. You tend to have these cathedrals, plain sawn material, and then it's kind of like this toward the end. If you really want to pay attention to detail on this, you rip this so that this and maybe this and one more are your face frame and door frame pieces. And, and we have two things going here. One, that's given me nice straight grain for the router table. The other is the aesthetic. So when you come back later for Mark and Roger's design thing, maybe this kind of thing will come up. When you have really narrow pieces, if this has got crazy flame pattern in it, it looks weird. Because it's just this like random pattern distributed all over that narrow piece. If instead, the grain is real straight, your eyes like that way better. So what you would do with this is, you rip the straight grain stuff off the edges, This these become your raised panel. You put the cathedral into the raised pan, and that's where you want that uplift. What else? Yes? More of a panel question, because I don't know if you're going to talk about panels. What do, you, what do you do for spacing? I mean, I've seen some balls or something else, but what do you do for spacing? So, yeah, so if, if you're doing a solid, the question's about solid wood raised panels, spacing them within the frame. So I use space balls as the product I, I use, this, use this for, use for this. Um, space balls are just little foam, quarter inch diameter rubber balls. And what we don't, what we want is the panel to have the opportunity to expand and contract within the frame. Where we live seasonally, high humidity in the summer, stupid dry in the winter. So we can't not allow wood to expand and contract. It's gonna do it. If you try to stop it, something's gonna split or check or blow up. So what the space balls do is they prevent the panel from rattling when it's at its smallest, but they are foam, so they still allow it to expand when it's humid out. So they are, I, I, I'd have to go back and look. I think then I'm making the panel like 3 16 smaller than the frame. You gotta, you gotta look at the space balls, don't hold me to that number. But you undersize the panel before you raise it so that when you put it in the frame, it'll accommodate the space taken up by those space balls. Don't skimp on the space balls. So one of the stupidest things I ever did, 
I made a king size headboard. And I was, I was pretty proud of it. It was pretty cool. So big headboard, big headboard, three by three posts, three by three posts, arch top rail, straight bottom rail, five raised panels. So this was a great um, exercise in flame and red oak. So the one in the very center, the flame was centered like that. And then this one, it was kind of a half a flame. And then this one was really straight. Then same thing going this way. So the whole thing kind of symmetried up toward the middle. So I think it might've been the first time I actually used space balls. So I put this whole thing together and I did in this panel, and I, all, I did this in every panel, a space ball and a space ball and a space ball centered in the bottom and then a space ball, space ball, space ball. So four in each panel. What happened to my panels? Now you tell me. So it's as hot as can be. I'm sweating like a dog. There was no sub assembly here. I had to glue, it's like seven feet long or wide. I had to glue the whole thing together in one fell swoop. I get all done and then and all the panels are canted in their frames because they're pivoting on that one space ball. So in the end, I could tap them and knock it back so the pattern was parallel to the frame. And then the other way to seal these things or to solidify them is from the back of the panel, you can put a brand, a brand, in the center of the panel that freezes it up in the frame. Then a brand is the key to that. There has to be just one in the middle so the panel can expand and contract from that center point. So I had to flip the whole thing over with all its clamps on it, get the panels in the right position, angle the brad so it would go through the back, through the panel, not come out the front, and then it, in the end it all, by dumb luck, it worked out okay. But, so, but I saved like four cents by only using four <laughs> balls per frame. So it was worth it. All right, 11.10, and somebody else is on deck, I think, at 11.30. Is that you guys, Mark? Okay. Thank you, George. Yeah. Uh, please give me George Thank a round you. of applause. Thanks. Some, some very, very good tips on using the router, making doors, and uh, something that will help you improve your woodworking for sure.